I significantly purchased a ton of properties. I purchased 19 units. So did you make a shift in your systems and hiring and- Definitely at the start, I felt like I still had to be involved, but definitely started realizing the importance of like working with A players and A player contractors and how much time and efficiency they save you. I think the point that maybe some people miss is that when you have a process that you do the same way every time, you raise the quality and then you lower the amount of time that you're wasting. One of my philosophies is like time in the game. I call it time in the game, but just to get really good at something, you have to have been in it for a while. Welcome to the Everyday Millionaire Show with Ryan Greenberg and Nick Calpas. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Everyday Millionaire Show. We're here today with David Hathaway, the richest sounding guy we've ever had on the podcast. What's up, David? I appreciate that. How's it going, guys? Good. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. We say that because I feel like, and our, our audience can maybe weigh in and let us know what they think, but I feel like David Hathaway there sounds like a famous either actor or maybe a writer. I don't know, but it's a cool name, so... Congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that uh, award for today. <laughs> so, Nick, how you doing, man? Good, good. How you doing, Ryan? Living the, living the good life, you know? I'm Got feeling to. good. Feeling good today. We usually do these podcasts at night when I'm like, Day's after over. the day has just beaten me alive. Drained. And now it's like, I'm fresh. I'm feeling good. Energetic. Yeah. I'm feeling good this today. Cool. Um, David, so what's going on, man? You're another, you're not a Baltimore guy, but you invest heavily in Baltimore. We consider you a player in the game here. So why don't you break down like a little bit about your business? Um, what do you have going on now? And where did it kind of, where did it start? Sure. I'll give you a little background. Um, went to Mason, grew up locally in Northern Virginia. Um, after I got out of college, I was always interested in money which sounds terrible, yeah. but always interested in making money, whatever that side also was. It was selling cars. I mean, I sold cars off of eBay for a while, um, but in, uh, dabbled in the stock market and real estate was always coming up. Um, so in college, Red did a bunch of self-reading about uh, real estate, purchased my first property senior year of college, then would purchase like one or two a year for several years. But right out of college, became a police officer, was a police officer for nine years. Um, got married to my wife, we had kids and realized, Hey, I'd been building this portfolio for a while. And at some point in there, I just was like, Hey, I have, I have three options and one of them has to go. I have real estate investments. I have my wife and kids and I have police work and police work at the time, uh, which I think was six years ago, just wasn't fun anymore. Which is like, this is so, not enjoyable. So, how for old me. are you? Let me stop you there. How old are you? 38. 38. Okay. Okay, cool. 38. I, I, like, years. I didn't know you were years between, young. You, yeah. between, you look like between anywhere from like 28 to, to 38. So, I was, you know, we were, once you get past 21, everybody's the same age yeah. and you have no idea. So, you don't want to offend anybody. So, uh, I, but it does matter in the sense that you had some real life application experience. Like, yeah. I had a full time job before, like, I did full-time real estate and, and running the businesses and having that like real life application to realize like maybe this isn't for me or it is for me. That's I think really important because if you just do it like right out of college, you kind of don't know what the other side looks like, but we all kind of know what both sides of that coin look like. Nick never really, you never really had like a real like career job, right? You just always built your own business, right? Yeah. I mean, I used to work at, I worked at Costco at one point and my first, my very first job was at Riverwatch restaurant in Essex. It's now Lunacy. And I was a dishwasher there when I was 13. I was super excited. I got paid under the table. It was 5.15 an hour. And that was like, I worked there for a couple of years and then that was pretty much it. Yeah, I I definitely, and I don't know about you, David, you can answer this too. Like I value the time that I spent grinding as a teacher, making like probably similar money as a, you know, a police officer. And I value that time because now I know that that's never what I want to do again. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good, Good point. Um, I actually made pretty good money. I work for downtown DC Metro Transit Police okay. Department, so I was actually making a hundred k. Oh damn! Uh, yeah, it was double what I was making. So. What year did you stop working as a police officer? Just to kind of get an idea of like what the salary was back then. In twenty eighteen, I could be off, give or take two years. Gotcha. <laughs> pre COVID. Uh, yeah, pre. I mean, maybe twenty seventeen. Um, but my epiphany came so. As I was acquiring properties, I would build up uh, as a police officer, we get time and a half. And, and instead of 
just taking it out as, as money. I would just put it in vacation time. And so people are like, you're always on vacation, dude. You don't do any work. And it was me just working at properties while they're doing the work myself. A lot of times I did the work on, on my own properties back in the day. Um, but when I started investing in Baltimore, I was actually like doing the work instead of doing the commute, drive in, sleep at the property, do work. So I didn't have to do the commute back and forth. Um, so I would like stay there for the night. Uh, but I had an epiphany one day as a police officer. I'd court the next day. And then right after I'd, I'd worked like a police court, know. like from being a police officer, yep. court. Yeah. So going to court as a police officer and, um, uh, had worked just a really long shift. So sometimes you get an arrest, you have to stay, you have to process the arrestees. So sometimes the shifts can turn in, you know, from 10 hours to like a 20 hour shift, or maybe you work, you know, more cause you just not going to go home for an hour when you have court like at 9 a.m. and you're like just finishing up the process at 8 a.m. But um, so I had this realization that I was like working at a property, then I had this really long shift and I was like, oh, I'm so done with this, but I wanted to go back to the property. And I was like, this is weird. I don't wanna be here, but I wanna be, and it's like, most people be like, why would you wanna work on a property or be involved in real estate? And it was just like this epiphany of like, oh, it's definitely my passion, like I could do it the thing was I could do it all day long. I think I had been working on the property for like 20 hours straight, then came to my shift, had a really long shift. And I wanted to go back to the property, but I didn't want to be there at my shift anymore. Mm -hmm. So that was my epiphany of like, hey, this is definitely my passion. I love it. Um, so how long do you have to be a police officer before you can retire and receive a pension? Is that 25 years? It depends. I mean, different places have different things. So I worked for nine years and there was a, I could have actually resigned after 10 years and then I would have been able to have a very small pension, yeah, uh, but it only would have been at collecting when I'm like 60, like it was like collecting. Okay. Uh, after I had to wait yeah. Yeah. and I was like, that's kind of dumb. So how many properties did you have and how did you know that you were in the right spot to just quit your job as a police officer? So my wife, yeah, I mean, my wife has a great job, so we had healthcare covered there. So I always knew like, okay, I don't have to really have to worry about the health. That's usually a, like a piece that people are like, oh, healthcare, healthcare. So my wife had a good job, so I could just rely on her for healthcare. Um, I think I had like 15 property, maybe, maybe 12, 15, probably, uh, probably 15 properties at the time. Um, so decent amount of cash flow. And I had just started investing in Baltimore and I knew that I just, I couldn't do as much as I wanted to do. Um, Cause you didn't have the time. Like, didn't have working. the time. I mean, it's just, I, and I was, I, you know, I wasn't willing to not be a good dad, not be a present husband. You know, that is, that's, a, that's its own job. Like husband yeah. is one dad is like another, mm -hmm. those are like full-time positions. So at the time I was actually mentally like, I have three full-time jobs. One's definitely got to go. Um, yeah. yeah but, we have a similar story in that sense of like had to, had my wife was also a teacher that's how we met so i had the health care covered and then from when you look at it and you're like what the amount of time that i can actually get to put into this thing that's making good money that has potential outweighs the you know the risk of leaving that job like that's how we that's how i had to like look at it in my head and then as soon as we quit both my business partner and i quit our jobs our business doubled like it just instantly doubled and we were like i wish we almost did this, you know, years prior, because I kind of knew in my head, like if I had just dedicated my entire schedule to, and I don't have kids, like I had, you know, we've been together, my wife and I now have been together for a while, but like we don't have kids. So like, I, I don't have that job. And now I'm able to dedicate all this time to the business. It just instantly took off. And we found all these inefficiencies and problems instantly. We were like, we need to start fixing this stuff. And, and it wasn't even like that we started doing that much more business. It was, we, we, that happened too, but we fixed a lot of the issues that like we had staff that were making more salary than we were making at school. So we were paying our employees more than we were making at school. And in our heads, like, what the heck are we doing? And yeah. we finally made that move. And that's when things like really, really started taking off. Did so. Did anything significant happen when you did quit your job as a police officer, whether good or bad? Like shortly after that? Um, so quit? right. Sorry. No, you're good. So right after that, um, I significantly purchased a ton of properties. So that like year after I left, 
I want to say I purchased 19 units, which is like way more before it was always like one or two properties. It was very like put 20% down conventional mm -hmm. route. Um, and then it was like a complete different ball game once I was like, okay, I mean, it's, all, it's almost like burn the boats, but not really. Cause I was already involved in real estate for a really long time at that point. Um, so I kind of knew that my real estate was good. Um, uh, I knew like equity had been built up. I had sold some properties at this point. Um, and I've always been a saver. Like I'm not a huge spender. Um, so, so when you were, you were doing this and you scaled up quickly, you bought 19 units before you were saying you were working on these properties yourself, you can't possibly work on 19 units at one time. So did you make a shift in your systems and hiring and how did that work? And did you start working less physically like with a hammer because you had to kind of be like a global leader of the, that portfolio? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so Definitely at the start, I felt like I still had to be involved just as a, like a cost saving measure. Um, but definitely started realizing the importance of like working with a players and a player contractors and how much time and efficiency they save you. And how, there was definitely the like epiphany in there of like, I'm actually costing me money being at these properties, doing any work, whether I wouldn't be able to do the right plumbing or something. Mm -hmm. And then I'd have to hire somebody else. And I was like, damn, I wasted a whole day on that. And it could have just been done in like an hour by right. like a master plumber. Um, Chase, you did press the record button on the audio, right? Okay. We did a podcast recently. Sorry to interrupt. We, did a, we, did <laughs> we an, didn't record anything. We did an hour long podcast where we did not record audio. Famous, so, famous I, last like, words. Now everyone, I'm like, we got to remember, we got to remember, we got to remember. But yeah, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, but so, that was, yeah, well, now that you interrupt everyone, so let me just talk about <laughs> <now. laughs> So that, it's pretty cool. Like the time is very important. And I want to talk briefly about when I was in the in the truck in the lands, because I have a landscaping business, I was in the truck every single day. And that year, I think it was 2019, maybe I got out of the truck. Maybe it was 2020 because I had my daughter in 2020. And I'm like, I need to be present, like as you mentioned. And I needed to figure out a way to get out of the truck. So I had more time to be there for her birth and, and all of that. So that year, 2020, I bought, I think it was eight properties. The very next year I replaced myself, got out of the truck for that full first full year. And it was 2021 and I bought 22 properties. So it was just like that transformation of me having to be in the truck every single day and not having that time to focus on something that was much bigger. And then as soon as I was able to get out of the truck, I almost tripled the amount of properties that I bought that very next year because of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, and then you the next year you bought like thirty something properties. Yeah, and then so on and so forth. So yeah, that I think removing yourself and David, we were talking before this about kind of what I'm doing in my businesses right now, and it's really like one of the big goals is kind of separating my name and my face with putting in and filling employees and business partners that and strategically doing so so that. I can take a step away and, and sometimes it's good to just like look from the top down and do like an audit of all the things you have going on because we still find like we were talking about bookkeeping, like our bookkeeping systems are great. Like we're doing really well with that. But recently we're finding issues with like efficiency and project manager spending money and how we're tracking that and kind of what we're doing with like labor reports and all this stuff. And like, if I was managing projects every day, I would have never been able to meet with our bookkeeper and find that that issue was happening. And it would have just kept going and it would have been fine to a sense, but we're doing 45 projects right now. If we did 90 projects, that system would fail. We wouldn't know where that, like there would be a break in that system. So without taking the time to like look down on top of everything and say, what's going right and what's going wrong and like, what can we change for efficiency? You're going to, you could kind of just plateau and, and stay in this kind of like, you know, um, so are you doing that? Cause I know you said you have one VA. Um, it seems like you are very much hands on to your business. Do you have any help with like auditing yourself? Um, so again, I want to go back to like, who you're working with and those like a players. Yeah. Um, I'd probably say the people that I don't have like business partners, it's very solo. Um, but my accountant, my bookkeeper, so I run everything through QuickBooks online. Mm -hmm. Um, so my bookkeeper, I guess would you could say keeps me in check. Um, I'm a very conservative investor though, and I'm very much about efficiency. Um, something that you said earlier about like, Hey, you can kind of be 
complacent and you, you start losing money or, or I'm very much like it's important to be, to be efficient. So you can scale a little bit, but, um, I don't even know where I, where I was going And with I, I should ask you that then too, because at the same time I, I said kind of what we're doing, but like, is your goals to scale to a certain point? Do you have like an end goal in mind or are you just along for the ride? So I love that question. It's a great question. Uh, and I actually do think about it a lot. Um, I don't have the perfect answer for like end goal. Um, I definitely think that opportunity is super important when we talk about like freedom uh, time freedom is like super important, but also just like opportunity freedom. So I like to do things that allow me opportunities in different things, whether it's social media or I'm like, oh, I could use this and whatever. If I'm a partner in a syndication, I can use this skill. Um, but just having not tying myself into one thing. So, I mean, we, we discussed a little bit about, you know, I don't want you know, a thousand or 3000 units. It's not like an in game. Um, I kind of actually feel like it ties you down a little bit. Um, and I'd rather do like passive investing in, into larger syndications and to really, um, we'll call them super valuable assets that I wouldn't be able to purchase myself, whether it's like a parking deck next to the Phoenix sun stadium or some like really awesome winery that's on the water on the Chesapeake Bay. And it has like a dock and a boat slip. I'd rather be invested in something like that where I know I wouldn't be able to take it down by myself, but I can be a passive investor, receive a return and really be hands off on stuff. So yeah. you did mention that you were selling some of your units uh, just a handful of them is, was that to put you in a position to do some of that syndication that you mentioned? Yeah. And so one of my philosophies is like time in the game. I call it time in the game. I don't know what other people call it, but just to get really good at something, you have to have been in it for a while, or you can be, you know, this all-star right off the bat, you flip a property and you make a hundred thousand dollars. But usually if you do that and you're like really successful right off the bat, it's really easy to lose money down or you make some poor decisions because you didn't really have that You're trigger happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, or you just didn't have that. Ex I mean, we call it, you can call it experience or whatever. You're like, Oh, I could have seen this coming. So I wanted to start investing now. Um, just because when I think about like in game, I think about talking to my 60 or 70 year old self and he's like, Hey, I'm glad you purchased a hundred units or I'm glad you purchased, you know, a thousand units. And I don't think my 70 year old self isn't like, I'm glad you purchased that next, you know, that next property. Um, I feel like I'm transitioning from like hands on having all these rental, I'll always probably have properties, whether they're vacation rentals, I've owned vacation rentals. I've owned, I mean, townhouses are my bread and butter. Um, I think I'll always own real estate in some capacity, but I wanted the passive investing just to be a bigger piece of the pie because it provided that time freedom, number one, and it provided that kind of that opportunity for like, hey, I can work with who I want and the family's covered. Like the safety security part, that portion's covered. Even if for some reason I get taken down in my property, like in my property somehow, maybe I get crazy, somebody sues me, I run somebody over in a car by accident and they take all my properties, um, which we do have some fail safes there. But I know the passive investments is like completely separate. So it's almost like its own investment business that isn't tied to anything of my own for real properties. Does that make sense? So I have a question for both of you now, because I've been rummaging this kind of idea in, in our head um, about, it's safe to say, Nick, you gross over a hundred thousand dollars a month in rent, right? Mm -hmm. What if you just took all of your cash flow? and might take out your living expenses and just started paying off all your houses and didn't buy anymore. Like we just stopped buying now and just paid off all the houses and you're making a hundred thousand dollars. Let's just call it. It takes you seven years to do and you pay off everything. Now, wouldn't it be in a sense like that you make a, let's just call it a hundred thousand dollars a month, which is probably more, but you make a hundred thousand dollars a month. You don't need that much money. You can invest, let's just call it 50% of it into the S and P 500 and just, you know, do the Berkshire Hathaway way or the, you know, just, just buying the, the indexes, you're easily 10, $20 million in net worth or more because you're a real estate by the time you retire. Doesn't that sound good? 
Yeah. Like, but do you think about that at all? Like just paying everything off and just collecting on all your rent? Uh, I mean, I think a lot of different scenarios. I mean, in that scenario, I don't love the, I mean, a lot of our properties are like 5%, 6% and the return is better elsewhere. Um, so I like using the leverage in that, in that scenario. Um, but rates keep creeping. Rates do keep creeping. I mean, it's not, I, I don't think there's a perfect way. I mean, a lot of times no, no, we no. try to it's shoe a, into like, Hey, this is the perfect. I think that's a great way. I there's don't, strategies. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't judge. Yeah. I don't judge, uh, anybody's way. I, I don't, I don't like then, to press my way on other people. So I, like, I hey. do think, I mean, I agree with that at the point to where I think I'm done buying, then it would make sense to go ahead and transition to let's start paying off these higher seven, eight percent interest rates off houses first and keep the low four and a quarter where they're at. And then maybe just do something like that. Like a but, hybrid. Yeah. But I think as we're still growing and I'm still trying to grow with, you know, with higher interest rates, it's a little bit more difficult, but once I get, you know, completely sick of it and want to throw in the towel, then maybe that's a, a, a strategy that I might switch to. Yeah. I, I always just, I'm like, in my head, running these companies is fun right now. You said before, you can't respect me yet because I don't have children. Is that on camera? <laughs> <laughs> so, so in my head, though, like I'm thinking well, that, that is the next step for me, right? And, yeah. and in, in my head, how can I safely say to myself, I'm going to be the best dad, the most present person for that person, you know, for my wife, for the kid, whatever. And if I'm doing what I'm doing now, that's not possible. Like I can't run four different companies and manage all this stuff and also dedicate a decent chunk of my time to that. So like, how do you go about fixing that? And I feel like in my head, it's like, instead of me thinking about managing 1250 units, like we were just talking about economies of scale and stuff. Yeah. Well, it's either me giving away equity, which I just did. You know, we gave equity to Diana DK Law and that's been a great thing for us. But then the next step is paying off these assets and not growing it. So then if I wanted to self-manage and not have a property management company, that wouldn't be such a big feat. I could probably hire a VA or two and maybe a personal assistant or something to help me with that. And the gross or the, I, I call it the net money that we're making is almost the same as having that scaled company with a lot less headaches, a lot less people that can try to sue me every month because they're living in my property that may have had a fire or whatever it is. Cause the liability increases as you gr grow more, right? You have a hundred houses. There's more of a chance that you're going to get sued for something than somebody that has 25 houses, whether they're paid off or not. So in my head, I'm just thinking that, and I don't think there's a perfect strategy. Like you said, I think everybody's got to live to their personal goals and whatever else. But I just like to hear from other people that are in the same kind of boat where you're like, huh, maybe this is a strategy that if the rates are at 10% next year and inflation's out of control, Maybe it makes sense to pay off the portfolio and then get like a blanket HELOC kind of loan from a bank or something that you can use to kind of play with or something when you want to. But other than that, because that was the one video that did really well for us, 50,000 plus views on YouTube, his whole strategy, he buys commercial assets with no debt, only equity partners. So every asset that they own, they do like industrial, right? Like I was doing like, mm -hmm. he does like industrial. Uh, so he rents to a lot of small businesses and stuff. His strategy is no debt from the bank because during the downturns, his partners get paid a little bit less, but there's no way that they can come at a refi and say, you owe me a quarter million dollars or a million dollars. He's always insulated in that sense. So instead of maybe making a, let's just call it a 15% cash on cash return, his investors are good with 10% or 8% because they know that they're completely insulated from any kind of downturn. Yeah. I mean, much to your point, I also think you have to, um, Think about like what type of person, what type of character you are. Uh, for me, I'm like super, super sensitive, which uh, I mean, as I've gotten older, I mean, back in high school, people would say, oh, it's the athlete. That's like, they're like, you know, it's the rough guy. Um, but I've always just been really sensitive. So a lot of times, and I'll give you an example of like why I don't necessarily want to do that. Two Christmases ago, when it was super cold, I don't know if you remember this. Oh yeah, we <laughs> frozen pipes galore. Okay, so you know exactly where I'm going. I even know. I mean, I did get involved, but it was Christmas Eve. I mean, we're trying to enjoy Christmas Eve. We got family over. Mm -hmm. I so we use Ring Central as part of our process, and so my VA can, you know, 
she can use Ring Central. She dispatches them to the contractors, to the tenants. But I still have it on my phone that I can see what messages are going through. And I take a peek every now and then. And I see, got frozen pipes here. It's Christmas Eve. What are you guys? And it was like, we had two different frozen mains. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even if you're not involved, so even if I'm 100% hands off, I guess I would just not have to see that and be like, hey, you don't call me for nothing. But if your if your apartment building is on fire, you're gonna want your staff to say, hey, we, we kind of have a thing here, and so yeah. it's gonna be mentally wearing. So for me, I you know I felt for my tenants. I'm like, well, we gotta fix this. It's Christmas Eve. We're not gonna have them not having water. I mean, it was a, it was a multi It was two multifamilies. So it was like a bunch of tenants, and then when they turn off the water, then everybody's affected. So then it's like, and it was I think it was two three unit buildings that both, um, and then. Like an idiot, you guys can learn from me. Like an idiot, I tell the contractor, I was like, all right, I'm going to get involved. I was like, he's like, it's just frozen. What do you think I'd do? Oh, the pipes are just frozen. There's no burst. You guys know what I did? Put heaters in it. Put heaters in there. Yeah. Dumbest thing you can do. Do not do that. <laughs> do not put space heaters in there. Then, like three hours later, tenants are like, hey, I think there's like water in the backyard. I was like, they're like, and we don't have water anymore. So he goes back over. He's like, oh my God, this is like a pool in your basement. I'm like, oh. So, but where I was going with that is, well, I'll go back to the, the first original point. You just kind of have to know who you are. And when you talk about like paying down properties, it's totally, I think if you can kind of like detach, then that's great. I, I don't know if I can totally do that. I don't feel like I'm a super strong, like, team builder i think i'm a good leader but not a good like hire the teammates person i don't know why <laughs> and everybody's got their everybody's skill got their set thing their thing yeah it's, absolutely that's why i like talking to people and that's one of the biggest things with the podcast man like yeah nick and i get to sit down and we were i was telling you this before like we get to sit down with people that have done way more than us people that have done less than us people that are in a completely different realm than us people that have started liquor stores people that have done commercial stuff and i get to just like we get to ask them questions and learn from them and like you're always a student and we get to sit here and anything that you say might click in my head I'm like oh well maybe that makes sense or what you just said like maybe it's a hybrid maybe we keep those two and a half percent three and a half percent rate mortgages and maybe we sell we just look at our portfolio from a where's the highest debt and just start paying that off. Or like this year, I'm, we got a couple tenants moving out of like single family houses that I went to flip a couple years ago and then saw the profits weren't that good. So I ended up renting them out because the rates were so low and you couldn't miss. So yeah. I have like a 3% rate on one, but I have like, it's like 150K sitting in there now. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm gonna sell that house. It's a single family house with a lot of walls on the outside, a lot of siding, a lot of stuff that could go wrong. I'm like, it's still nice. We fully renovated it. We're gonna sell that this year. You're gonna get rid of that. And like that, is a, a strategy where we take that 150k and push it into one of our eight percenters that we just refinanced recently and maybe that's the strategy you know and figuring playing with those numbers so that's one of the reasons i just love talking to people i think i mean if we want to like put this into like one box i think we're talking about deployment of capital like where are you putting your capital and why and i think about that a lot like where am i deploying my capital why would i pay off the house would i put it in some sort of syndication would i buy another rental um what's going to be the best return for my money or what a lot sometimes at, at this point in my life i mean it's not always like i don't always think of what's the best return um, luckily I don't have any investors right now. <laughs> so it's not like, Oh, he doesn't think sometimes it's like, I really want to support this person. Cause I really see eye to eye with them for whatever reason. Maybe I really like some philanthropy they're doing. Maybe I really like just something about what they're doing and I just want to support them. Um, I, I'm not going to lose money with investing with somebody, but if right. I'm like, Oh, I'll, I'll take a little bit less return. Maybe I'll take a 8% return just because I really want to be involved in something. Uh, but I think it's when it boils down to what we're talking about, just where you, where do you want to deploy your capital? And are you okay with the returns when you're talking about like the properties? I'm in a very similar boat. So I'm going to sell two properties that I've held for a really long time. Um, they're not in Baltimore uh, and they have a ton of equity. Um, and I, I think I, I did an episode on this a while ago that a lot of people don't talk about, but it's return, return on equity. You look at Instead of just the cash on cash return, which Absolutely. is, hey, I put $20,000 in this townhouse and you always think, oh, my $20,000 is making X. And you don't think about, 
well, that townhouse is appreciated. I actually have 120 if I sold it in there. So actually, in both of these houses I'm gonna sell, my return on equity, I think is like 2.8% and like 2.6%. And it's like 200 something thousand per house. I'm like, I gotta sell these things. Right. Like, cause you can always have the one-off expense of like, a lot of times we don't think of as investors, we think of like expense ratio and a lot of we'll make like a percentage. we will be like, oh, I'm gonna have like 10% that capex goes to expenses. Yeah, yeah, CapEx. Um, and sometimes we don't think of that those CapEx come in bursts. So if you have a water main leak, all, your CapEx is all in like a 15 day period and you're like, dang, if I would've sold this two months ago, my returns have been amazing. Now they're not as good because I just had to put 15 grand yeah. this month. New HVAC, new roof, Yeah, whatever. and I don't think a lot of people think about it. So sometimes I'll think about like, how much life do we have left in a property? And I'm like, oh, I don't want to put on a new roof. We're just going to sell this thing because if I have to put on a new roof, or more recently I sold a couple of um, duplexes because they had these AC units that were on the roof and it wasn't just the AC, it was an all in one AC heater on the roof. So you had to have a crane, they're yeah. really heavy. I wanna say each one was like 10 grand, maybe maybe a little bit more. And I was like, oh, I do not wanna take that expense. I know we had been kind of keeping them going for a while, but I knew eventually in the next year, two years, three years, somebody's gonna have to pay. It's gonna be me or I'm gonna sell them. Yeah. Um, so I took the, I mean, took the money, it was a good return. It would be less of a return if I had to pay ten grand for each, and that's where we're going to come up with soon too. Like Nick and I started investing at the same time, but like we did most of my properties are we fully gutted and renovated, right? Yeah. But now there, some of them are seven years old. So now those HVAC systems that were brand new have been getting kind of beat up. Probably the filters weren't changed the right times. Now we have systems in place for that, so that gets done right now. But for couple of years, they probably were just getting the crap beat out of them. So we have a life expectancy on these houses that the we, maybe we did the roof, but they're rolled roofs. They don't last for 25 years. They're not shingle roofs, right? So now we got roofs coming up where, yeah, sure, we were making 500 bucks a month when we started or 650 bucks a month, but taxes have gone up. Insurance has gone up. So now that 650 is 450. And now in three years from now, we're starting to change HVAC systems. We're starting to change roofs. And all that profit that we made for sometimes a year, two years, just goes into one Yeah, that's hard. Stupid. It's hard to talk about. People don't totally realize it. They just look at the numbers on paper. It's right? not a 30 go, year oh, hold, man. don't do anything yeah. for 30 years. That's not a true statement. Maybe yeah. your loan is 30 years, sure. But you have people living in your houses for long enough without like, really keeping up with redoing things or whatever it is, even the vinyl floors, like they get beat up after a while. These houses aren't perfectly level. You're going to start changing the floors. And even with people like Nick and I, who I own a construction company, Nick has his own crews. It still costs money. All of it still costs money. This stuff's still $2 and 50 cents a foot. Like whatever it is, that stuff will add up and it will beat you up after a while for the people that are getting into it thinking for 30 years, I'll just sit, hold, collect the money. That's not what, that's not going to happen. So David, I kind of want to jump back to when you first started. I think this will help out some of our listeners. Sure. Um, cause you're, you're about an hour and change away from Baltimore. However, you are still considered an out of state investor. So, and, and you're very hands on from the beginning. So how can you, if somebody's listening, who's maybe out of state, who do they reach out to, to get started? How did you become familiar with the Baltimore area to feel comfortable to start investing in that market? It's a great question. Um, I had looked at Baltimore a couple years before I actually started investing. And I drove, you guys will like this, you invest in Baltimore. I drove the streets and I said, no chance am I investing in Baltimore. I was like, that, you're crazy. Because it's a, it's a, I don't even know how to explain it to a lot of people. It's a gritty, never had we'll been, call it gritty. I mean, <laughs> some area, it's, I mean, some people describe it as like bombed out. I mean, it looks like, like war zone or like zombie, like it could be a zombie apocalypse in parts of the city. And so if you're not familiar with that from Northern Virginia, like everything looks good, <laughs> like it's all nice. Yeah. And then driving, I'm like, oh, no chance. And you get scared of the supply. Um, so then when I came back, I just did a contrarian thing. I had the same feeling. Um, and I was like, you know what? I just gonna invest, just gonna start invest. We'll, we'll see how it goes 
because I'm scared. I think most other investors will be scared of the areas that I'm going to invest in. And so I think that would give me the advantage. And I also really liked that I was an out-of-state investor. Um, it gave me a different lens than people from Baltimore, um, where I'd have like really good investors that would be like, you're crazy to buy in that zip code. And they just blanket entire zip code. And it would make me nervous. And I was like, oh, I'm probably an idiot. But some of those properties that they were like, hey, you're an idiot for buying those zip codes have been my best, most profitable properties. And I'm like, if I were to listen to this person that has you know, so many properties, I think at the time, person had like 80 properties. And they're like, you're an idiot for investing in two and two and seven. You're dumb. Um, then I wouldn't have made the money that I made on the, I mean, the, it was probably the best deal. I purchased a fourplex and uh, or four different buildings um, at the same time in 21217. And, two and, and they're all multifamilies. They're all like two units and three unit buildings. And they've been awesome been great. What were some of the systems that you had to change from being a Northern Virginia guy where things are a lot different than coming in to build a portfolio, manage a portfolio, do the construction? What were, did you have some systems that you were working down in Northern VA that probably didn't work up here? And did you kind of change it all? So another great question, the system. So I think the two huge books, you know, for people that are like, Hey, I want to start my own real estate stuff. I want to be investing. I want to build a portfolio. Two biggest things for me was profit first was like a game changer that I incorporated four years, maybe, maybe a little over four years ago. That was like a huge game changer for me. And then, um, EOS traction, um, was a big game changer for me of like how we look at projections why we do what we do, what's the company culture, even though it's just me and the VA. Um, I just, I can look at like our core values, which are like integrity, transparency. And it, because it's on the wall, cause I see it, even if a contractor calls me and is like, Hey, I can do that for like 20 grand. I'm like, you are like 10 grand over budget. What are you talking about? And I don't really want to call them back because I know I'm never going to work with them. I'll see that core value of like transparency, integrity. I'm like, well, I'd want somebody to call me back and be like, Hey dude, I just can't, I can't work with you. You're a little overpriced for, for what I'm looking for. Um, so that was a big, those are two systems. Um, I also built out a, my own property management processes and systems on Trello. And it's very much, if, if you guys have read checklist manifesto, Nah. Just, I mean, it's just being like anal with checklists um, on how you do each one of your processes, whether it's move out turnover, or whether it's um, lease up, whether it's property acquisition, um, whether it's just looking at a property. I mean, I'll share this one because I think it will help people. Um, I have this process. It's called uh, it's called a background check. So if I'm thinking about purchasing a property, we have all these different checklists. One's like, look at the, ta- uh, look at, uh, I don't even know what the, because no- I'm kind of out of the process, <laughs> but one's like, look at the tax ID, um, pull up the permits. Um, it's like, go look at the water bill. And so the VA goes through, looks at everything, pulls it all, but there's like links in all the checklists. So it makes it very easy. So if I'm thinking about purchasing a property, I say, hey, can you do a property background for 123 Main Street? They hit these things. It's very quality assurance because I know if I was just doing it on my own, like back in the day, I'd miss you know a $3,000 water bill or something. And then at closing, they'd be like, oh, do you know you have a $3,000 water bill? I'm like, oh, what do we got a broken pipe? You can still close on it or we can back out. Um, so it allows you this quality assurance. But just, I mean, if I if one thing that I can give to like investors that this helped me is just to, to do things the same way that it's almost like a franchise model and that property background of like doing it the same way every time and going through a checklist when I'm looking at purchasing a property has been super helpful. I feel like a lot of people don't do it. Yeah. I think the systems are what, have helped us so much where like in the beginning you're kind of just like for us anyway i I don't want to speak to anybody else but like we were just kind of like scrambling and learning you know trial by fire this and that and then as soon as you get a system that works you're like oh wow we were working way too hard for the same output like then you then you're like okay well what's the next thing that we can systemize and um i was chase just i got chase a va for the brokerage because he's kind of like our lead agent he's spearheading a lot of big efforts in the brokerage and i said like one of the big things is you got to meet with them, get a standard operating procedure and learn basically the processes that they're going to do and like put it down on paper. And then as soon as his VA started, 
she started kind of with a guide of what we're going to do. And I think Chase could speak on that was kind of like helpful to have something before you hired it. Cause he was always saying like, Oh, I need a VA. I need a VA. I was like, first build out the scope of work, build what out the VA needs to do what they're going to do and then do it, record it on loom, put it in a folder and tell them to watch it five times before you meet about it. I, I think what, I, it, yeah, it's great. I think it's that awesome. It's been helpful. Yeah, think, no, think that's awesome. I think what, I think the point that, maybe some people miss on this is that when you have a process that you do the same way every time you raise the quality and then you lower the amount of time that you're wasting. I mean, for example, a lot of investors when they're looking for properties will probably go on Zillow and maybe they don't have a filter. And so they're looking, I remember doing this. So I'm speaking from example. I'm not, I'm not shaming anybody. I did this quite frequently when I didn't have a filter of exactly what I was looking for. I remember going on Zilto, Zillow and clicking on the same property and being like, have I looked at this property yet? I mean, you guys probably know what I'm talking about. Have I looked at this property? And then you start clicking for, oh, I've looked at this one. I yeah. don't want that one. Yeah, you see like, the oh. stupid pink bathroom. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I remember yeah. the pink bathroom. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just a ton of time wasted instead of setting up a filter and like what you're looking for. So you're not looking at the same properties over and over. So once you build out just, even if it's just a checklist and it doesn't need to be anything fancy. No, a lot no. of my stuff is not Doc. like crazy fancy. It's just like, okay, I can click this box. So I know I've done the step and then your qualities goes way up and you're like, holy smokes, I'm not wasting any time or I didn't miss a step. Um, yeah. often and every now and then when we like miss our process or just, Maybe they just, a VA overlooks it. Maybe they didn't turn on like the BG utilities. It needs to be part of your process. When you close on a property, somebody's got to close on BGE or else what's going to happen? Contractor's going to come over. And he's going to go, hey, we don't got any utilities here. Uh, the crew really can't do any work without any utilities. And it's like super hot in here. And so you lose like a week. Maybe you can't get back on the schedule. Mm -hmm. And that's just a process issue and a quality issue. Um, but I, I don't know if I, it's just, I think it's super important to have that checklist. So you're like, or just create one, even if it's not perfect. And then you can start to see where your issues are. Right. Yeah. How'd you determine when was the best time to hire your VA? That's a great question. Um, I just thought it was a progression. Um, and it's not perfect. I mean, you have to learn a new role. Um, you go from solo operator to like, leader feel like you're actually doing more work when you bring the va on right for a while and you're like why yeah. am i do i'm doing so much work this is not 100%. what i signed up for and i, you, I tell everybody that. it's very frustrating i i recently hired <laughs> chase a va and then i hired jocelyn a va who who's like stepping in as part of a leader of my property manager company and i told her and i told him the same thing i said it's going to be work in the beginning it's going to be work building out the systems it's going to be work meeting with that person every day learning their personality learning what motivates them that's work but when once it clicks, like my VA dude runs my life. Like he is a stone code killer. Like he is like so good at anything that I need, anything that Chase needs. Like I could text right now and say most of the things that I would need to do today and he can do them. And I hope he listens to this because he's he's been a game changer to just our business. And the other day I sent him a nice little bonus because I'm like, I'm throwing all these projects at him. I'm like, I told you about the, the thing that we're at rolling out with like the conglomerate and all that stuff. I'm like, I need a landing page. I need to split this website and this website. And like, I just see emails between like our web designers and him. And like, I just told him my goals and he's fully taking that on. That whole role is just him while still answering my phone calls while still doing whatever else we throw at him. And that to me has been like the biggest investment that I made in the beginning where I was meeting with him every day. And I told Chase in the beginning, my biggest mistake was I didn't realize how much better they would be at certain tasks than me. So they were doing things way faster than I could do them. And I was like, oh, I'm going to give him this, this, and this today. That'll take him eight hours. And then by like noon, he's like, hey, I'm done. What do I do next? And I'm like, that would take me three days. How did you do it? And he's like, oh, I have AI for this. I use this. I, I have this system that I use with my old people that I worked for. You worked for KW organization or whatever. And he's like, yeah, I just know how to like do that. And I was like, I stumbled for years doing, trying to figure this out. And you just came in and figured it out and did it way faster than me. So that was work. We definitely often procrastinate on the things we don't want to do. And so when we hand it over to somebody that maybe wants to do it or, or doesn't just not want to do it, you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. So you, they do it really quick. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you have to realize what you're good at and it, what you're not good at. 
I'll, I'll go back to I'll go back to your question, Ryan. And was that is that your first VA that you've hired, or have you gone through like one or two? No, that I'm was my somewhere. first that VA. Was first, yeah. I've had in person assistants since okay. we started, basically, but never a virtual assistant. And that was somebody recently, a friend of mine, recommended this company that hires VAs for you, and blah blah blah. And that next thing you know. That's it. Cyberbacker for those uh, that are listening. I was going to ask. Yeah. So you guys are, <laughs> it was coming out. I have a referral with them. So if you, if you are looking for a VA, nice. let them know that the Everyday Millionaire Show sent you. And we have a referral uh, kind of partnership with them. And they've sponsored our events. And, you know, they're, they're great people. And they train their people so well. And they, they've been a game changer to us. Like, and my friend Jesse, who we were talking about, told him about him. Like, you got to hire a VA. And he's like, oh, I've had them. They, they're not that good. But I'm like, go through this company, hire them, train them, and they will be a game changer. And he has been, then said, thank you. Like, so, on my VA, and I'll answer, I mean, I've gone through a few. I thought you were going to give me a different, different answer. It didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. I had like one or two VAs, and, and this is super important. The first VA that I hire, I didn't know how vulnerable that I was actually making myself. And I had just had like password, just like stuff that they didn't even need access to. But I was like, I have all my, just trying to simplify all my stuff in one spot. And I didn't totally realize um, until I hired my, my second VA. And they're like, why do you have all this stuff here? I was like, I don't know. It's all in the same spot. <laughs> so anybody can use like, your VA doesn't need any. I used a, I used a, outsourcing company so they hire the va and then um or a job placement company and our va is in the philippines i think yours is the same do you have a va yeah i don't okay but i use our va i'm getting around to it so i went through a, a cycle our first va i think he was working for like two different companies i think he was like moonlighting i think that's mm -hmm. a lot of times what vas do because there was things that he should have known that i was like how do you how do you you like did this work order yesterday how do you not know what this work order is. So I was like, you, you got too much going on or mm -hmm. it's like, I need you only for me. You're 40 hours a week and you are for us. Like, you can't have you working eight hours for somebody else. And then you're not like dialed into our stuff. Um, so that was my, my epiphany. But uh, the one thing was like, you need to be careful on what you're sharing with the VA until they like develop that trust. They don't need every, they don't need the keys to the castle and everything. You kind of do divvy it out slowly, but I, found go back to your original question was like when did you know you needed a va um i just thought like i had a decent amount of work um the the worry i think for most investors is always do i have enough work they're gonna the sit around and do i and i think that you just accept that off the bat you're that they're gonna waste some time um I mean, you can develop a huge list, but sometimes it's difficult. But I also use my VA as a property manager, but I also, my VA is basically like an EA. It's like an executive assistant. Like, yeah, hey, you fill out these financial documents. Has nothing to do with property management, but it has to do with like, we're getting processed for a refinance. Can you fill out this document for the, just to save me on time of stuff that I don't want to do. I'm like, I don't want to fill out that. You know my stuff. Just fill it out and send it over to the yeah. lender. Um, and I use her as, you know, the way like real estate agents use their VA to get our stuff and f do follow-ups. Um, so we'll like incorporate follow-ups on, on the, in, in like incorporating everybody. Hey, you need to attach the insurance agent to the lender, to the title company, and you just keep track of them every three days. Hey, how are we doing? What do you guys need? And, and I think another thing, the right way to hire somebody is if it's not going to financially sink you or put you in a risky situation, the right way to hire somebody is really right before you really need them. Because once you really need them, then I feel like it's like a scramble to first f hire somebody quickly. So you don't want to have to just hire the first person. And two, when you need them, you're it that you're stressed out at that point. Yeah. So you're thinking, I got to just get this, 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 and then you're overloading them with something. So really, I feel like the right time to hire any kind of employee, like a project manager or whatever, like if I had to train a new project manager, but I was stuck managing 10 or 15 projects myself, how would I possibly take the time to train that person. You can't, you yeah. have a maxed out. So before you're actually maxed out, you got to hire that person. And there's the learning curve of you're, you're stepping into a new role. Yeah. You have to, you have to lead somebody else or dictate to somebody else, which is, does, there's no way to learn it until you do. I, I think, I think there's no like way to be like, Hey, you're trained to bring on this assistant. You're just going to, the first time you bring on a virtual assistant, 
it's going to be like a month and it's kind of going to be painful and then sh- yeah. should start getting better. Um, so I have another question. How do you handle your turnovers and tenant placement? Do you still handle your tenant placement yourself or do you sub that out to a tenant placement company? So we don't have any boots on the ground for our in-house property management, but I do use like two leasing agents. Um, so I use one leasing agent for that was, was am I answering the question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I uh, leasing a one for market tenants, one for section eight. We I'm sure we all use the same section eight person. What about walkthroughs for, uh, property turnovers? Um, a lot of times it's a leasing agent. Um, sometimes they'll just send the contract contractor over, um, I'm still heavily involved in our project management. So if I like purchase a property and we're doing a renovation, I don't hand it. It's not property management anyways. Um, I mean, I guess it could be, but I've found that property managers usually are not great if you're trying to do like a big reno. Uh, but I haven't, it, that's a whole nother set of systems. And sometimes they have unique questions. Do we add a bedroom in the the basement and that's not a, if the VAs in the Philippines, they're not going to know. Like, right. Do we, Hey Dave, you want to bet? I mean, it's just going to come back to me anyways. So I've just, and I, I actually really enjoy that. I, I like working with our contractors. It's a relationship piece with me. I really enjoy the friendship. Um, I enjoy the design. Um, so that's a piece that I haven't given up, but I will let the, you know that is the hardest position to fill It's project. A good project manager is the number one hardest position to fill in that construction piece. 100% by far. Yeah. It's like, because they you got to have somebody that thinks like you that knows pro, like knows projects from start to finish can talk to contractors and the contractors will answer them. That is a very, very hard position to fill. So that, that's just one of my pieces. If you are getting started, like just be your project manager for a while, learn it so well, like be a perfect project manager before trying to hire somebody because that is, it's next to impossible to find somebody that's really, really good and motivated the same way that you are. That's, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, it's always good advice to do it yourself and then you can outsource it if you want to outsource it. I still think it's really hard for like those big projects. And I had, I'd had, hadn't always had in-house property management, right? I've used plenty of property manage, managers. I purchased my first property and it was in Raleigh, North Carolina. It was my first property. So I was like all out of state. And then I did go down there to fix it up, <laughs> drove down there, slept in the place for a week, fixed it up, fixed up what I could, then came up and then was like, all right, contractor, you can put in the deck, you can do this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't even know where I was going with that. So, but all right. So I'm going to start wrapping up here. So David, how can people find you? I know you have a YouTube channel now. Can you plug that? Like how could people get in touch with you? You have a sure. Facebook group, the real estate mastermind, right? I do. So why don't you go ahead and plug that so I don't misspeak? Sure. Um, So Dave H Media is the Facebook group. It's mainly geared towards people that are looking to invest in Baltimore. All mindset things, uh, systems, everything I do for investing in Baltimore um, is there. And then in any of the YouTube descriptions, you can find our private Facebook group, kind of share things that are going on in Baltimore, uh, best practices. You can connect with other investors. yeah. And what, what's your YouTube channel? You said Dave H media, Dave H media. But if you okay. type in Baltimore, Dave Hathaway, you'll find me. I mean, I don't think there's a ton of Baltimore like niche YouTubers. I mean, I've had a lot of like random people that are like, Hey, I'm from Buffalo, New York. You're like the Baltimore guy. I'm like, all right. I mean, not necessarily the Baltimore guy, but, but I'll, but I'll take it. <laughs> hey, I think Baltimore is an interesting city to yeah. be investing and in. people are from all over the country. I manage a bunch of properties for people that, live in California and New York and Denver all over the place because Baltimore is one of those markets where it's a low barrier to entry. So yeah, it's a good place to be on YouTube. Um, we do have an event this week. It's not going to come out. This podcast is not going to come out uh, before that. So not worth plugging it, but <laughs> into, <laughs> thanks into, for plugging it already. I plugged it. I already did. Um, already done. Yeah. So <laughs> thanks for listening guys. And uh, until next time.